us. And uh, I hope that everybody is okay because we'll be um, recording this webinar because I think we're going to have some really uh, interesting uh, discussions and uh, really want to be able to share that um, after after the webinar as well. So I hope everybody is is okay with that. And um, yeah, so welcome. This is a um, a webinar that is uh, jointly being hosted by the Arise Consortium and and Chorus. Um, and both of these research consortiums are working on uh, issues around health and well-being in in urban areas. Um, and um, the structure of uh, today's webinar, we have we have just one hour, so um, we're going to uh, keep to time as much as we can. Um, so I'm I'm Helen Alsi. I'm a prof in public health at the University of York. And I'm lucky enough to work with both Arise and with Chorus. Um, and um, we will start with uh, some quick presentations, 10 minute presentations um, on the Arise framework that has uh, developed out of the Arise work to understand intersectionality and gender issues um, within informal settlements. And Laura Dean um, will be uh, presenting that. And we'll then hear from um, Sushama Kanan, who is from ARC Foundation in Bangladesh, who will be talking about the framework that we've used in, um, in Chorus to understand intersectionality and gender issues. After those presentations, um, we will have a panel discussion with researchers from across the partners um, from Arise and Chorus. Um, and you can see here the, the great spread of partners that we have from both uh, consortia, um, from uh, Kenya, from India, from Bangladesh, uh, the UK, um, Sierra Leone, um, and from Chorus, from Bangladesh, Nepal, um, Ghana, and Nigeria. So we have a real range of perspectives on and uh, uh, on gender and intersectionality issues from, uh, from a number of different contexts. So I think this is going to be a really interesting discussion. I would ask that um, you put your uh, questions and comments throughout uh, during the Q&A, um, in the Q&A section on your screen. And um, there will be a moment to ask uh, questions of clarification after the two presentations, firstly um, from Laura and um, then from uh, Sushama. And, um, and then after the panelists have had a chance to really talk through how they've used the frameworks and implications for policy, um, there'll be another chance, if we don't run out of time, um, for, for us to, to respond to some questions from participants. Um, and I will uh, talk you through the, the speakers as we um, move on to the, the panel discussion. Um, but you can see their lovely faces there and um, the range of uh, researchers and contexts that we have um, represented today. Uh, so, um, and uh, yeah, we have to acknowledge our funders um, for both um, the research consortia. So I think without wanting to take up any more um, time, um, I will hand over to our um, first presenters and um, we will start um, with uh, Laura talking through the uh, in the framework that has come out of the Arise work. So Laura, if I could hand over to you, I will stop sharing my screen. And if you could go ahead Thank and you. share your screen and hand over to you. Let me... Brilliant. Thanks, Laura. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Helen, um, and thanks everyone um, for being here. Um, as Helen said, I'll present to you on behalf of the Arise Hub um, and specifically the health and wellbeing group who um, work together. We've developed this kind of um, approach to equity analysis. So firstly, I just wanted to give you something to think about as we move through today's webinar. Um, so inequities are all around us and some are easy to see and some are less visible. On this slide are several pictures that I obtained from a quick Google search um, this morning. And these pictures emphasize just how divided our cities have become. And I was with a colleague recently in Sierra Leone and they explained to me how they'd not really noticed or considered many of the informal settlements they passed each day on their way to work. 
And in, in fact, my, I myself hadn't noticed those which I could see from my hotel window. And so my question to you as we go through this presentation and perhaps as you travel home tonight is when did you last notice the way in which social and structural inequities are often so visible yet ignored within our societies? So within ARISE, um, we're really focused on, on trying to recognise these inequities and work with organisations of slum dwellers as well as different institutions um, to, to, to change these and challenge these inequities. Um, we're particularly focused on tackling inequities within and between informal settlements and recognising that not all experiences are the same. But how do we do this and what's our approach to equity analysis? Largely speaking, um, within ARISE, we focus on a social determinants approach, um, which aims to unpack dimensions beyond the biological and to draw attention to political, environmental and structural factors that underlie health and illness. And so what that means is we need to begin with the recognition that interconnected dimensions of daily life and informal settlements increase vulnerability to a wide range of health and psychosocial challenges. Commonly recognised dimensions included risks of infectious disease due to crowded housing, poor ventilation, lack of water and sanitation, as well as air pollution. But perhaps less well recognised is the emerging burden of non-communicable and chronic disease and mental distress related to issues around food availability, insecurity and violence, including gender-based violence. Of course, all these health issues are then exacerbated by a lack of access to quality healthcare, which can be financial, social and geographic. But what we've been talking about so far are the proximal factors underlying the risk of ill health. But for a social determinants approach, we need to really go deeper and ask why the, the circumstances of daily life are this way. And so within Arise, we try to think about this and, and link our, our, our dis discussions around equity to informality. And informality can be understood in many ways. A simple definition is a kind of settlement or economic activity that's outside the realm of the legal formal institutions and processes of the state. It doesn't mean it's illegal, but, but often, it, often it can be. Um, and so why is it outside? And it, it's normally because informal settlements have been a, um, uh, a result of the state being unable to meet the basic rights and needs of people from that are either migrating from rural areas or um, it might even be as a form of survival for the urban poor and um, to create spaces of entrepreneurship. And so the problem is fundamentally one of unequal power relations in society that deny people their human rights and entitlements to realise their health potential, largely as a result of structural violence. And within ARISE, we're trying to focus on tackling issues that the social and political systems have in place that shape these issues. Um, and that means ultimately addressing issues of structural violence. But this is challenging to do. And one of the main critiques of structural violence is that it's a challenging framework to use on its own to consider issues of health equity. So alongside a consideration of the role of structural violence in shaping the politics and processes of informality, Within ARISE, we also draw an intersectional theory that is inherently gendered to help us unpack these challenges. Intersectional theory allows us to recognize that there are many underlying inequities within informal spaces themselves that shape challenges and possibilities for health that people face. For example, there's a, a large range of inequities which intersect in different ways and in different contexts at different times. So the influences on the health of a woman working as a waste picker in India will be differently shaped from those of an older disabled man in Kenya, for example, although they both experience exclusion and deprivation caused by class, caste and based on economic inequalities. These are experienced in different ways due to their social positioning and including as a result of their gender. Within ARISE, we're interested in how to create social movements and agendas that are inclusive of those diversities. We had to begin to think about how merging of these different concepts and theories can support us to operationalize consideration of key factors that contribute to health and equity in the settings where we work. And largely, how do we emphasize the role of violence in its visible and invisible forms alongside gender and intersectionality theory to allow for practical application of complex academic terminology in a real world setting? 
So collectively within our, our health and wellbeing working group, we've come up with the following framework. And our analysis of inequities stems from the application of these combined social and anthropological theories to document the inequities that um, within the lived experiences of the urban poor who are both living and working informally to support the advancement of collective action. Specifically, we think about how three interconnected forms of violence interact to shape multiple and compounding layers of violence within the lives of people living and working informally. So as I said before, we utilize the theory of structural violence to consider how political, economic and social inequalities can both cause and consequence of poor mental and physical health. And we consider this form of violence largely to be the type of violence that produces violence and we try to analyze how larger level structural factors really shape the micro level social processes um, that 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 create visible violence in the in the everyday lives of people and shape both their emotional and physical health we then think about symbolic violence as an entry point to consider how implicit inequities such as sexism racism and ethnocentrism can contribute significantly to poor mental and physical health we think about how symbolic violence largely becomes an internalized process as a result of social domination to which many people who live and work in informal spaces are subjected to as a result of their age, gender and caste. We try not to think about this form of violence to limit agency, rather it must be recognized and considered to enhance spaces of collective action. When considering symbolic violence, we also note that the domination of the dominant by the domination means that sometimes in the case of patriarchal advantage, for example, men can be dominated by the cultural and social expectations of masculinity and subconsciously try to live up to ideals of what it means to be a man. And this helps us to consider how individuals negotiate their own roles of the dominator and the dominated within larger political, economic and social systems. Finally, we think about everyday violence or behavioral acts intrinsically connected to symbolic and structural violence. However, this form of violence allows us to think about how some acts of violence become repeated so often that they become routine and if kept hidden or unaddressed for long enough, frequently become normalized as part of an individual's everyday experience. However, as I said before, we recognize these forms of violence don't influence all individuals in the same way. Rather, they intersect with individual identities, which of course themselves constituted by intersections of things like sex, age, gender, and economic status to shape nuanced experiences and outcomes for individuals within specific populations or subpopulations. So within ARISE, we, we center intersectionality as a critical underpinning theory. We also recognize the importance of intersectionality as a theory in influencing how people facing multiple intersecting exclusions and marginalizations can organize to, quest to question the ide ideologies that justify inequities, as well as contesting their institutional and material bases. And so by merging these theories of violence and intersectionality, we're able to consider how varying forms of violence interact and are mediated by characteristics at the micro or individual level to create specific and nuanced experiences of health and social inequalities. The additional of intersectionality theory was essential to operationalize theories of violence to consider how individuals micro positioning within broader macro structural and social processes shapes their specific responses to health and illness and how this varies through space and time. So the case studies that you'll hear about from ARISE today begin to highlight our application of this framework and form part of an intracategorical intersectional analysis, which means they allow for consideration of the specific experiences of key subgroups within larger social categories. And an example of this that you will have seen before is Crenshaw's analysis of black women's experience within a white feminist discourse. So the case studies that are considered are pre presented here on the screen. And these specific subpopulations and case study groups were identified as those who were particularly marginalized through the use of participatory methodologies. Um, and so that's why these case studies kind of came together to shape our intercategorical analysis. 
So just to finish again by acknowledging our funder, but particularly the Arise Health and Wellbeing Working Group, um, who've really worked together over three years now um, to, to develop this equity framework together. Fantastic. Thank you, Laura. That was really insightful and incredibly helpful, I think, to, to see um, that, uh, that framework that you've used within Arise. Um, can I just ask all participants, as you're listening, please do um, put your uh, any questions and comments in, in the Q&A, um, and uh, we can come to them um, after the two presentations. Um, right now, though, I would like to move on to our next presenter, who is um, Sushama Kanan from um, ARC Foundation. Um, who is going to be talking about um, the framework that we've used to, to support work in, in Chorus. Thank you, Sushama. Over to you. Thank you, Helen. Am I audible clearly? Yes, that's absolutely fine. Very clear. Hello everyone, my name is Shoshana Kanon and I work as a research fellow in ARC Foundation. In CORUS, I lead an action learning group on gender and intersectionality. Sushama, if you could speak yeah. up a little bit, it is a little bit faint. Thank you. So the content of my um, session is a brief introduction to CORAS, how gender and intersectionality have been addressed in CORAS. We have used Morgan Framework, so I will talk a little bit about Morgan Framework and how the framework helped CORAS researchers. So the full form of CORAS is Community-Led Responsive and Effective Urban Health Systems. It is a six years FCDO funded research program um, which has been started in 2020 and will continue till 2016, 2026. And uh, there is a collaboration of seven organizations across five countries. The organizations are, you have seen, University of Nigeria, University of Ghana, ARC Foundation and Black James P. Gandhi School of Public Health from Bangladesh and Heart International from Nepal. In CORAS, we aim to strengthen the urban health system by linking across the plurality of providers, multi-sectoral collaboration, responding to the double burden of non-communicable diseases and communicable diseases, and identifying, reaching, and engaging urban poor. And these four aspects are the pillars for CORAS. One of the expected outcome of CORAS is to co-produce gender responsiveness and pro-poor intervention. And to achieve this outcome, um, there is an interlinked five stages plan, which is being implemented in all chorus countries. In stage one, a need assessment and solution generation activity took place with community. Uh, concurrently, in stage two, analysis of existed data, literature, and policy was done to find out the gap. In stage three, currently, we are co-creating the health system intervention with community service providers and policymakers. And the next stage will be to implement the intervention and in stage five, all country will evaluate the effectiveness, cost effectiveness and impact of the intervention. So the first four large projects of CORUS in each country, they are, um, they are looking at uh, different aspects of health. So in Dhaka, Bangladesh, uh, they're looking at strengthening urban primary health care system to deliver essentially essential NCD care. In Nigeria, they are developing and institutionalizing health system linkages between formal and informal sector. In Ghana, implement and evaluate a package of interventions that enable sustainable provision of life cycle health promotion. And in Nepal, understanding the mechanism needed to strengthen primary care delivery for NCDs for urban poor. So how gender and intersectionality was viewed in CORUS? We have seen that within all the CORUS cities, it is the individual and community identities which determine the health outcomes and the health behaviors. 
And these health outcomes and health behaviors are underpinned by exposures and access to quality health care. These are again further shaped by wider social, political, and economic structures and norms. Moreover, as Laura already have said previously, when gendered identities intersect with other social stratifiers, that also results in inequity in health and well-being. And the examples of other social stratifiers uh, which are given previously are disability, ethnicity, religion, caste, socioeconomic status, etc. Another factor is rapid urbanization. So rapid urbanization also changes gender and social norms. It also transforms patterns of discrimination and disadvantages. These discrimination as, and disadvantages, um, they also create inequity in health system. However, these inequities are often so ingrained and also so embedded within societies, within structures and systems that you often become blind to their existence and thus it remains unchallenged. These inequities can be seen both within health systems and within our own research organizations. Identifying and addressing these inequities is a core principle of the CORUS Research Consortium and that's why we are focusing on gender and intersectionality to incorporate in our research as well. So to ensure that we are addressing gender and equity within our research and our consortium, we have established an action learning group in CORUS, which is focused on gender and intersectionality. This group has a core group of eight to 10 members from all CORUS partners. This group meets usually monthly and it allowed the members to share their previous experience of gender and equity work, highlighted the extensive experience across the team and share with all other. To help all the researchers in CORUS, the ALG members have developed a gender and intersectionality guideline, which you can find in CORUS website. This guidelines aims to help the researchers across CORUS to identify approach for how to address the gender inequity aspects in their project. There are several gender and intersectionality frameworks researchers can follow or adapt for their study. So we have used Morgan framework in our guideline, which I'm presenting in the next slide. This framework was developed by Morgan et al. in 2016. These frameworks can help researchers to organize their thinking, to develop gender sensitive research questions, to develop data collection tool. It can help during sampling, data collection, analysis, and write-up. It helps to ensure that gender and intersectionality are incorporated throughout all phases of the research process. If you see the framework, it has some domains and researchers need to ask a set of questions in those domains. The framework helps us to consider gender as a power relation and driver of inequity in health systems. It identifies how, how power can be constituted and negotiated in the context where we work. So the first set of question focuses on access to resources by asking who has what. The resource might be money, transport, um, healthy food, or any other resources that influences health. The next question is who does what? This question guides us to consider the division of labor and about everyday practices. This could include um, how caring responsibilities or working outside the home influence access to care. Then we need to consider how values are defined. What are the social norms? What are the ideologies, beliefs, perceptions that control how people live? Finally, who decides? What are the rules and decision-making process that regulate health and health-seeking behavior? And the next section looks at how norms can change by considering how power is negotiated among individuals and institution, also within wider society. What are the individual power relations within households? So this could be across genders and also as they intersect with different social stratifiers. Then we need to consider the institutional and social levels and think through the power dynamics between different genders 
according to relevant strata. All of these domains can change because of the social shift and power relations that happen within health systems. So considering the factor that uh, influences these changes and the way how the changes happened in the past can help us to identify strategies and action which can help to bring equity through our research. So the last discussion is how the framework helped CORUS researchers. Ideally, the framework can be applied at each stage of the research. However, we are pointing out to three major stages, which are during conceptualizing or designing the research, during developing data collection and actual data collection, and also during analyzing data and producing output. However, in research, it did not follow the framework mechanistically. Rather, our use of the framework was evolving in nature. Although the framework was not used during conceptualizing the projects because our projects were not solely gender focused. Um, so during developing data collection tool, the framework helped us to think about asking questions in a way that can explore the influence of gender and other stratifiers for the aspect that is the particular research is going to focus. For example, in Bangladesh, it assisted researchers to think about sampling and they include the third gender as well to know about their health seeking behavior and how the systems provide them health care. The framework was used to more understand the influence of gender and their social stratifiers in accessing and providing healthcare services. It helped inform the analysis and teases out the information considering different domains of gender, which might have been overlooked if we haven't used the framework. We categorized and coded the information under different domains of the gender framework and also looked at cross linkages between domains. It also sensitized the aspects that should be looked at to understand the inequities, taking gender as an entry point. It also helped us to develop our output as well. We have presented our preliminary findings on gender and intersectionality in terms of provision and accessing healthcare services in urban conference of uh, international conference of urban health in 2022. And there is also a case study and blog has been published on the findings, which are also available in Quora's website. And we also arranged a webinar for Corus researchers on how to use the Morgan framework in their project. And that was all about it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sam Sharma. I think that was really helpful and a um, great explanation of how to actually kind of practically use a framework like this at all the stages of the research and how um, how Corus has, has sort of done that in. Um, uh, not a sort of mechanistic way, but really adapted it to, to the different research questions and projects. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, we have a couple of questions um, in, in the, um, the Q&A and um, really, really interesting to, to see. And uh, so we've got a question around um, which gender frameworks um, are there any that have been specifically developed to address health in urban areas? Um, any experiences of working with ministries of gender and um, uh, or gender ministries of gender or ministries of uh, family? And, um, and some really nice reflections on the frameworks. So if I can ask our panelists to um, keep looking at the, the Q&A and please do type your answers to any of those questions. Um, and we can come back to them at the end after the panel discussion as well, I think. Um, but in the interest of time, it would be great now just to uh, turn to all of our panelists and um, ask them to really reflect on the, um, the how they've really applied these frameworks within um, the, the work that they've been doing. So um, I was just trying to share my screen so you could see the um, all of our panelists. So I'm hoping you can see that. It seemed to disappear when I put it on. Oh, there we go, that's better. Um, so 
Uh, yeah, I would like to start by by asking, and I think I'm going to go in no particular order, but just following the the, the photos of our, our speakers on the screen. Uh, so uh, Abriti is work a senior researcher with lots of experience on uh, gender and qualitative research from from Heard International in Nepal, working with Chorus. Um, and I'm going to ask each panelist to talk through how using these frameworks has really helped them to understand health outcomes, health behaviors within the city context um, where you've been working. So Abriti, if I can turn to you first, would you like to just explain a little bit about from, from the work that Herd has been doing, um, how the framework, kind of what kind of insights have you got from using that framework? Uh, thanks, Ellen. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks, Ellen, for this opportunity. Yes, um, I think as Susma and uh, Laura has mentioned, like how the framework has been helpful. So it's the same uh, with also with us, like when we use this uh, Morgan framework to actually guide our, our like need assessment study on the chorus project. So this actually has helped us to understand and uh, look through how the gender differences across uh, various domains and also across different social determinants have actually influenced or shaped the experiences, uh, opportunities, constraints, and power to seek healthcare within the urban poor context. For example, if we take uh, the uh, findings or if we uh, reflect back on the findings from uh, the uh, study, then we could uh, we found that there was a variation in the type of uh, health facilities that urban poor visited, which was also determined by the gender and other social dimensions, such as age, occupation, economic status, among uh, others. So mainly, uh, we could see the intersection of the gender and occupation often uh, within the urban poor context, where uh, most of the urban poor were daily wages workers, and uh, they had limited time availability uh, to go and visit uh, the health facility and get their services, which means the availability and accessibility of the health services was one of the uh, important factor that actually determined the health seeking behaviors uh, of the urban poor. So for example, they mentioned like they prefer going to the health facilities or let's say even to pharmacies or to private clinics uh, which are nearby to save time because they don't want to lose the time. Do, uh, they don't want to uh, go off work and uh, like not earn their or some amount to get the services rather than going to the health facility, government health facility, where the services could be available for free of cost or at a minimal cost. But then like you uh, might end up like not having time to go back uh, to your work, to the work and then like uh, spend more time at the health facilities. And uh, when it comes to women, the gender norms, uh, which uh, talks, which shapes the dual responsibility of uh, doing the household chores and also earning, then the uh, situation is more uh, difficult and different. And as they had to, as they have to like manage both the responsibilities, they again prefer uh, and uh, they again did uh, and they again prefer going to the facilities uh, nearby. So this is one example where we could see like how uh, the factors has influenced the health, how the occupation or let's say uh, the gender has influenced uh, how they uh, influence the choices uh, they make uh, in terms of seeking health care services. So it seems like it would be important to look at these factors and understand the intersections within the urban poor context if we really want to reach the unreached population and uh, make the services more equitable and uh, yeah, reached. Yeah, thanks, Ellen. Thanks, Abriti. Really useful, um, useful insights. And if I can turn to um, Abu Conte, Abu from Comas in Sierra Leone. Abu, would you like to share a little about the Arise um, framework and how that has helped understand uh, gender and intersectional and gender differences within the context in Freetown? Good morning, everyone. And um, my name is Abu Conte from the Sierra Leone Urban Research Center. Slock. Um, I'm actually uh, um, stepping in for a colleague, Bintu, who is from Commerce. So, so actually, the the framework has really helped us in Sierra Leone to understand how um, gender and intersectionality are deployed within research, particularly within the broader context of um, structural violence, 
which actually shapes health outcomes and um, you know health seeking um, 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 preferences that people make. So we all know about the Galtong framework, which is, I mean, a kind of framework which tries to really examine how you know, structures you know, of, of power perpetuate inequalities in societies, you know, and then trying to also examine how these structures of power shape the differences in terms of health and outcomes. So this is very much important in our research because we see from the Arise research that all of these frameworks really apply to the data we've collected over a period and how these have helped us to, have really helped to shape our understandings about these um, inequalities. So um, the structural uh, violence framework and the Arise framework as adapted now really helps to, I mean, grasp some of these um, um, health outcomes and differences. For example, it has helped us to, to, to ask certain questions around health outcomes by trying to really understand why are certain groups of people are continually excluded from healthcare services, like people living in informal settlements, or why is it that some people are much more sicker than some of the uh, uh, people living within the urban, urban space. So one way we have tried to conceptualize this is that we try to uh, situate structural violence within history because you can't understand structural violence within history and it's also understood from, the, from, from context. And that context is also rooted in how society is socialized, how people uh, deploy their systems of education, systems of power, to shape the differences that happen within uh, society. So we see it as a, a form of slow or structural violence that has been happening through um, um, physical violence, um, through implicit symbolism, you know, and that simple symbolism is really what brings the labeling of people within certain spaces. For example, in Freetown, we hear people talk about people living in informal settlements, and that brings a sense of stigmatization and then also it links also to gender the moment people talk about women in certain senses they they, they are considered as as inferior uh, uh, um, members of the community so this labeling and inaction by society to correct these things in some cases brings some form of normalization around these things and then it helps to really make health outcomes much more um, 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 harder and difficult for certain groups of people. So I'll just talk briefly about two sets of data which we have deployed within this study to understand these um, uh, nuances in detail. So for example, I have my PhD data which is around chronic disease and health seeking strategies. And then also we have the Arise broader um, um, data which one of a, a subset of it talks about um, um, the experiences of sex workers. So when you look at the Arise, sorry, the, my PhD data, for example, it 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 tries to um, to to explore the, the long, longitudinal structures of violence, which is linked to gender stereotypes and things like that. For example, people living with, women living with chronic uh, diseases, a lot of them we have found to have been denied access to education just simply because they are women, and then they are male. Uh, 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 or their brothers were allowed to go to school. And so because of that, they have lacked the, a long period of opportunities in life, lack of education, you know, I mean, uh, low prospects for income. And then there's continued violence and stress. And this leads to um, chronic diseases within those settings like hypertension and, and things like that. And because of their income levels, it makes it difficult for them to access healthcare, and particularly because of the spaces in which they live. So it's a constant pattern of exclusion, which links to certain groups of people. And then worst of all is the fact that the state's response to, 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 to uh, chronic disease uh, is very almost negligible because priorities are not linked to uh, providing services for people living with, within those, those settings. So when you look at it from an intersectional point of view, it, it, it kind of envelops different levels of vulnerabilities. For example, being a woman, having, being low income person, being unemployed and having 
poor health outcomes, all of these increase the, the vulnerabilities from an intersectional point of view. And then finally, I'll just talk briefly about the Arise um, sex workers experience. It also links to, um, I mean, the structure of violence and then the implicit violence around labeling of women who are in sex work. And a lot of these women come from uh, rural areas escaping from poverty. They migrate to the cities expecting a good life, but then they can't have good life because they are probably not connected or maybe not in the right places. And they experience violence from the police while doing their work. So, and, and there's neglect from the state to protect them. And despite this, the fact that they are providing services like sex work, but they are stigmatized in different spaces, including um, 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 having access to healthcare. So Mike, I'll just end by just trying to ask, how can we meaningfully deploy, I mean, the, the framework of, of equity linking to intersectionality um, and structural uh, violence and gender to be able to understand the different layers of vulnerabilities that happen within the informal settlements. So thank you so much. Thanks, Abu, and apologies, um, definitely from Slurk, not Commas. I do apologize for that on the, on the slide. Um, and thank you for those reflections. We are getting very tight on time and I want to go around everyone. We did want to also hear if panelists had key recommendations um, for funders, for policymakers. So can I ask the remaining panelists, if you have a kind of burning uh, recommendation that you want to add, please do add it um, as you're answering my next question. So I'm next gonna go to um, Adrita, um, who's been working with the Arise team in Bangladesh. Adrita, could you um, explain um, how, how these frameworks have helped you understand intersectionality and gender within the context in Dhaka, and please do add any recommendations for policy as you're as you're speaking. Thanks, Adrita. Hello, everyone. This is Adrita Rahman from Bragg James Cyprian School of Public Health, Bangladesh. And in this part of the session, I will discuss our case study on female-headed households in informal settlements in Dhaka. So, by single or by female-headed households, we mean households where women are either widowed or abandoned or they're separated or divorced or have no male earning members. And these women are the sole earners and decision makers in the family. What happens is that we basically notice that there's a complex interplay between poverty and power relations and the gender dynamics that results in these women in female-headed households in slums to experience high levels of vulnerability when we compare them to men. And these women are solely responsible for earning money and for taking care of the family. And as a result, what they do is they prioritize their family's needs over their own health when they fall sick. Um, between buying food for the family and paying rent and bills and children's tuition fees, they do not prioritize spending their limited income on paying doctor's fees and buying medicine for their own health conditions. They have you know, their visibility and their mobility vary, and they also face greater harassment, you know, late at night and are more discriminated against. Uh, what we also saw through our, you know, field work is that the longer waiting times in public hospitals mean that women from these female-headed households would need to forego the opportunity to earn wages as normal informal workers who are not, you know, as they've been working as informal workers, who are not entitled to have sick leaves or any paid leaves and are under the constant threat and worry of losing their jobs. To ensure that their family members are well fed, often these women from the female headed households, what they do is they cut down on their portions and reduce the number of meals, the frequency of the meals that they take that can lead to greater instances of malnutrition and adversely affect both their physical and mental health. We also noticed that women in these female-headed households who do not have families and live near and who do not have families that live nearby or you know have family members who are better off than themselves have lesser support in terms of the social, you know, social support networks. And they also hold less power and have lesser access to resources when compared to their, you know, male-headed households that we can draw a comparison from. 
And this in turn influenced their health seeking behavior. For instance, during COVID-19 lockdown, what we noticed was that when reliefs were distributed, these women from female headed households had no, specifically those who had no son in their house, could not receive that aid, not only because these cues or these lines were dominated by men, and, uh, and also because these men often tend to have a better connection with the local leaders when compared to these you know, women from female-headed households. And I think with that, I feel that that would give you a picture of the intersectionality and the gendered impact that these women face. So thank you so much. Thanks, Edrita. And uh, moving on quickly, I know we're, we're running out of time. And uh, thank you to the panelists who are responding to all the Q&As, because um, we may not have time to talk those through, because I'm very keen to hear from, from all of our panelists. So if I can now turn to Chinere. Chinere, uh, can you describe to us some of the, the impacts um, within the context where you've been working um, in Enugu and Onitsha in, uh, in Nigeria? Okay, um, hello, Helen, thank you very much. So um, very quickly, I would like to reflect on um, an interesting uh, finding that is coming out of a, a preliminary analysis uh, from uh, qualitative uh, interviews with uh, informal providers uh, in urban slums. So um, Actually, when we started out with uh, the framework and trying to do this, the gender and intersectionality analysis, our interest or focus actually was on the um, end users or service users. However, in um, interacting with the informal providers, uh, we began to see a pattern in um, access to resources among informal providers uh, that is, um, you know, influenced uh, by gender and uh, intersectionality. So I'll just share um, an experience uh, we, we, we had or the case of a particular uh, informal uh, provider, um, a woman who had um, a patent medicine store. Um, however, she, she's a nurse, she's a trained uh, nurse uh, midwife. And the reason why she opened uh, the patent uh, medicine store is because uh, she couldn't get a job in the formal sector. She couldn't get employment in the, uh, in the formal sector. So um, one uh, uh, interesting pattern that we're finding is that uh, among these informal providers, you will find that uh, the patent medicine vendors, for instance, are mostly men. It's a male dominated uh, practice. Meanwhile, the traditional birth attendance is a, is, um, a female uh, dominated practice. And um, we also are finding you know, patterns uh, um, with respect to a uh, level of education um, among this informal provider, uh, among these informal providers have appeared to have more um, um, education. They are more, they have access to more uh, information. They have access to more networks than the traditional uh, birth attendants. And, um, we are finding this interesting because the um, we would like, or the 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 goal, the end goal of our project is actually to um, uh, institutionalize linkages between informal providers and the formal health system. And while we are we are going to come up with some criteria for determining eligibility of informal providers to be linked, you know, um, into the, with the formal health system, some of the criteria that we are going to be coming up with, um, we, we need to be careful. So what we are um, 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 actually, you know, becoming more sensitized to is the need that we is the is the need to be mindful in uh, how we describe and apply the criteria that will come up that we will eventually come up with, so that we do not um, in in the course of uh, trying to um, make uh, create services that are of better quality to people in the urban slums that we do not uh, through our intervention propagate any you know gender. Um, uh, differences or imbalances in, in access to resources, particularly for the informal providers. So that in the end, we are not having, you know, like it's, it's the 
um, it's a, a particular gender because they already have access to resources and they would be more likely to meet our eligibility criteria. And then the other group of informal providers, the other, you know, would then not, you know, uh, meet the criteria and then they keep, you know, just staying there. So, I mean, that's just what I want to share, an interesting bit of work and how we are um, actually thinking about uh, how to take it forward with designing our interventions and, and implementing them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chinere. And great to see that the analysis on the supply side in terms of providers. And we're really running out of time. So for the remaining four panelists, um, please do just keep to a very brief insight. Um, if I can now turn to, to Ivy, um, who has been uh, looking at these issues within uh, informal settlements in Nairobi. Ivy Chumo, please uh, do add your, your contributions. Uh, thanks, uh, Helen, and uh, thanks everyone uh, for joining. I am here in Nairobi, uh, Kenya, uh, at African Population and Health Research Center. I also I'm part of the ARISE uh, team. And uh, briefly, I am going to speak about the child head of households and um, just to uh, reflect at a personal level that you can imagine uh, being a child and uh, being uneducated and being poor and living in an informal settlement and heading a household. So that's the context of most uh, child head of households who are living in the informal settlements. So they face all kinds of uh, challenges and uh, COVID-19 and any other um, emergency exacerbate their vulnerability and uh, marginality. And for them to seek healthcare uh, is very challenging, especially the fact that they are children um, they, they depend on adults who are not there for them, and they, they lack the education that anyone would need to think, and the fact that they lack the ties. So uh, the few things that um, drives or uh, their health-seeking behavior, uh, the first one is their societal demands. Um, traditionally, uh, the society would support children, and they would be treated as wealth. But contemporary society, the society that we live in, um, in the informal settlement, most times children are taken as a burden. So they lack somebody to lean on. When they are sick, they just stay behind at home. Uh, they don't have that capability to think that they need to look for antenatal care services. Uh, so they just stay um, at home and the condition can even make them to die. There's some child head of households who've been dead um, recently because of some issues related to their inability to seek for health care services. Uh, the second bit of it is their biological and uh, physical needs. They have so many unmet needs. And the fact that their children, they're poor, they're uneducated, they live in the informal settlements, and most services are informal, including the informal um, health care that exists. Uh, they end up depending on anyone around them to offer consultation on their health services. So there are many cases, uh, or one instance, for example, where the child-headed household, uh, their children, so they relied on their neighbor to offer drugs for eye ache for their children. And the child ended up being blind in the long run because they used uh, drugs that was already expired. And they got advice from uh, incapacitated person. They didn't have the capacity to diagnose someone for, for the eye or even to recommend them to seek a better health service. The last bit of it is uh, the institutional invisibility that these children lack a voice. They don't have a voice. Remember their children, um, they are seen as mini adults, so they are treated as children. Uh, they should be depending on adults, but no adult is available to support them. So in the long run, they lack a voice. They lack somebody to represent their voice. And the policies or the institutions are not representing them, including the policy agenda. 
so with those um for our case um for that case we recommend that there's a need to treat uh, children as children and not uh, mini adults and that they should be reflected in any policy agenda or any other agenda uh, thanks thanks so much ivy and um really helpful to hear those intersections very quickly moving on to uh lauren who's uh, from been working with the chorus team um, from the University of Ghana, Lauren. Thanks so much. So um, I'm just gonna touch briefly on the Ghana's CHIPS program, which has been the focus of uh, chorus Ghana's work so far in Ghana. And I'll talk a little bit about the gendered perceptions of the program and then the relationship with um, policy status and other um, issues. So the CHIPS um, stands for Community Health Planning and Services Initiative, and it's a national policy that places nurses in communities to work with them to achieve the objectives of providing basic primary health care. And the nurses are supported by volunteers who liaise between the health workers and community members and um, support activities like community outreach and home visiting. So the CHIPS policy has been scaled up nationwide, but its testing was initially piloted in rural areas um, and was a lot of focus was placed on maternal and child health indicators. But um, according to the national policy, the CHIPS is to support um, both men and women across all stages of the life course through activities. And it's supposed to be adapted to the unique needs of each community through nurses and communities working together. Um, our findings so far from our needs assessments in Ghana show that in urban areas, um, there are some challenges that um, are faced in delivering the program, including the limited number of nurses, um, logistics, and the limited understanding of the community about the program, as well as the difficulty of sustaining volunteers in an urban context. And this, um, this reduces the ability to actually implement like a true life course approach and also to adapt the program to urban areas. So the CHIPS program, as it's implemented in these settings, caters a lot to maternal and child health and sexual reproductive health. And the community has a perception that it's mainly for women. Um, so there's a need to find ways to engage other populations, including men, and to consider the unique um, health needs. So we are... We are considering that because, as was mentioned, chorus involves um, co-production. So we are currently trying to uh, brainstorm with communities on ways to address these issues. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lauren. And yeah, I think the, this really highlights this need to not just transplant uh, health systems that, and, and services and programs that have worked in rural areas and really thinking about how to adapt them so they respond to these these kind of urban urban challenges. So thank you so much. Um, Partho uh, from the George Institute in India been, has been working with Arise. Uh, Partho, would you like to um, just talk through the, how, how you've used the frameworks and uh, if you could try and keep it very brief because we are almost yeah, there. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, the context is that I work with migrant uh, waste workers in India. And most of these waste workers are driven to urban areas, uh, mostly from uh, agrarian distresses, natural calamities, and large-scale displacement. I mean, uh, displacement happening from large-scale developmental projects. And this also drives their vulnerability in the in the urban areas, in, in the sense that when they seek healthcare, uh, they are often denied services based on the discriminations they face at the hospitals. That comes out of their caste locations, the sort of work they do, because uh, waste work involves a lot of associations with purity and pollution. And there have been cases where the waste workers have been de denied uh, healthcare services, especially in the pu public hospitals. There's also the additional element that within the villages, there are these networks of middlemen who encourage or who rather convince the villagers to go to particular uh, public facilities in the urban areas against which these middlemen, of course, get some commission. So there is this almost always this networks of uh, middlemen involved in informal set settlements who are working in uh, who influence people to seek uh, private healthcare services. And then uh, when we uh, want to like shift gender norms and uh, promote uh, inclusion and diversity, it, uh, we must also understand that governance systems are not always keen to work with the most marginalized people because 
it depends on the larger political economy as well as the sort of uh, what uh, sometimes simply derives their political covet commitments and then formalization is always uh, not on the agenda of a uh, governance systems it's very difficult to work with informal waste workers because it is the informal waste workers who are sort of subs uh, subsidizing the uh, urban systems in terms of waste collection and the entire uh, waste management ecosystem and my um, brief uh, recommendations to policy makers will be to uh, uh, strengthen and uh, fund the public uh, health system particularly particularly the uh, primary healthcare system and for funders it would be that uh, we need a very i mean working with informal uh, workers particularly migrant workers needs a very long standing commitment so we need a long uh, research, research uh, uh, cycles so we need a sort of a long standing funding uh, so that would be thank you so much pratha really uh, valuable insights and and uh, thank you for those recommendations on policy as well so finally i do appreciate we're a little bit over time but i hope that um, a lot of you can stay because i just want to turn to um sushama kanan from um art foundation um to talk about some of their their work um in in dhaka with the, the transgender community in particular so yes yeah, sushama over to you for the final world Thank you so much, Helen. So in Bangladesh, our project was about strengthening urban primary health care system to deliver essential non-communicable disease care. And to explore the context in our need assessment phase, we collected data from both urban primary health care providers and the community surrounding the um, urban primary health facility. So we found that there is difference in male and female in terms of accessing and providing care. However, the particular findings that I'd like to talk about is how the third genders receive primary healthcare services in urban areas and how they're provided services from the perspective of supply side of health systems. And according to Morgan framework, these findings fall under how the value is being defined and what constitutes power relation among different social strata. So our qualitative findings showed that the transgender community within the city faced discrimination at the health centers. It was found that um, there's a huge stigma across the healthcare providers and also other clients regarding the third genders. Both healthcare providers and the members from the third gender community reported it. So the participants um, from the third gender community reported that the staff often, the healthcare staff, they often has told them that they should not attend the facility because it will upset other patients. In addition, the staff, they also feel uncomfortable and they prefer them not to come to the clinic. The reason is they're afraid that there may be a dispute and lots of arguing if the transgender patients are waiting in the waiting room. So they're often told to be seen either the last or they're deprived of treatment. One of the third gender respondents, they re uh, reported that he did not get access to enter a private hospital when he went there with her sister because of his gendered identity. They also um, told that uh, usually they prefer to use pharmacies or the drug store, those uh, which are near to the slum areas where they live, as they know the pharmacy owners and the uh, Drugs to people usually show them more understanding and empathy. Whereas they do not get treatment at all or being treated rudely from the maximum healthcare facilities. And because they face so much stigma and they are pretty much neglected, consequently, they hardly attend other family healthcare centers. And when we talk to healthcare staff, they also say that they do not get to see many third genders, only one or two of them visit the facility once in a while. Although the healthcare providers told that they treat the third genders equally, but they also pointed out that how other clients become upset to see them in the premises and wonder why those group of people goes there. And in that case, they are not interested to take services from that clinic as well. So uh, to recommend uh, for policy making, I think it's a long term it needs a long-term plan because people's mindset will not change so quickly. So there should be some provision of healthcare service 
that the transgender community, the third gender community can access. And there should be long-term plan to change the people's views and stigma around the community. Yeah, that's all, thank you. Thanks so much, Sushama. I think really valuable insights into a very um, under-researched um, area and just great to have that um, collaboration and involvement of the transgender community in Dhaka um, in the work that you're doing. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I apologize that we have gone over time. There've been some brilliant questions um, coming up in the Q&A and um, I can see that panelists have been busy responding to those. Um, so please do have a look at, at some of those answers. Um, we will be sharing the recording of this um, uh, on both the Arise and the Chorus websites. So please do take a look as well at, at the, some of the case studies and blogs and papers that have been published by both consortia because they, I think they really bring um, some good insights into many of the, the areas that we've only had a chance to, to really touch on in this webinar. Um, but I think really fascinating to hear um, how valuable this kind of analysis can be in really understanding and unearthing the kind of inequities that are being seen in um, urban contexts, particularly um, in informal settlements, and um, understanding how these, these um, gender and intersectionality uh, characteristics are, are um, being transformed and social norms and gender norms are, are, are changing within the urban context. And um, that does in many ways leave a lot of room for kind of optimism that there can be um, progress and um, this kind of um, addressing some of the discrimination and the health systems uh, challenges uh, that, that we're seeing in the kind of structural violence um, that has been highlighted within Arise as well. So I think um urbanization can lead to to changes and uh, can move things forward and progress um, and i think these kind of insights that we're getting from this research can really help us to move forward in that direction um, so thank you so much to all our panelists for sharing your insights um, i'm sure that everybody listening will be be really excited to see um, some of those insights uh, coming out in various outputs um, and please do keep checking the, the Arise and Chorus websites for more details of all those outputs. Um, so a very big thank you to all the, the speakers and the panelists and to all of you participants for, for your great questions and your, um, your involvement in the session. It's, it's been a really fascinating, um, but too brief, um, but great. And thanks, thank you everyone for joining. So I think we will, we will sign off now and have a, uh, a good rest of the day. Okay, thanks everybody.